AFI is support, encouragement, inspiration. AFI is learning by experiencing and analyzing cinema history and learning by doing. AFI helps you find your own unique cinema voice and AFI champions your voice ringing out. I love AFI.
ladies and gentlemen, the president and CEO of the American Film Institute, <laughs> Bob Gazzal. Here's the thing. I am not today going to give you the speech about hope in horrible times. I will not. Because what you've learned at AFI is better to do it than to say it. And just gathering here today says it. We are here to celebrate you graduates as the hope that we have been waiting for. Because together, you're going to walk out of here an army of artists with stories to tell. Stories that will heal, stories that will inspire, and stories that will plant the seeds of empathy, reminding the world of our common heartbeat. <laughs> Let's begin simply by saying welcome to the graduates, to the graduates of next year who are sitting behind me, to family and friends, to our honored guests, Bob Daly, the chairman of the AFI Board of Directors, Jean Picker Furstenberg, President Emerita, 27 years at this podium, AFI trustees, honorary degree recipients, faculty and staff, to all we say welcome to the AFI Conservatory commencement exercises of 2016. Now take a moment and look around and soak this in. For these are hallowed halls, once referred to as the temple to the talking picture. Sid Grauman, 90 years ago in 1926, broke ground right here on this very spot. And it was during construction, according to legend and lore, that the silent film star Norma Talmadge accidentally stepped in wet cement. Sid Grauman thought, Let's turn this site into an actual monument to the movies and their makers. And today we have living proof because both of our honorary degree recipients have their hand and footprints cast in stone. And perhaps even more importantly, their films have danced across this silver screen. This is the place that West Side Story had its Gallo West Coast premiere in glorious 70 millimeters. And this is where Kill Bill had its star-studded Hollywood debut, right here. Now, like many people in Hollywood, the theater has had some work done. <laughs> But the history here is old. It opened in 1927, and the premiere was a silent epic about the life of Christ, Cecil B. DeMille's The King of Kings. One historian noted that the night had three stars, Grauman, DeMille, and Christ, in that order. <laughs> the program began at 8.30 at night, and it went something like this. Grauman spoke. He introduced the director, Fred Niblo, who had had great success with the silent film epic Ben-Hur just a few years earlier. Then Grauman introduced D.W. Griffith and Griffith's bow. Then Grauman introduced Will Hayes from the Hayes Code and Mr. Hayes Code. And then he introduced Mary Pickford, America's sweetheart, and Miss Pickford's bow. And then she pressed a button made of Chinese jade that launched a live stage performance called The Glories of the Scriptures, which was scripted by Sid Grauman and accompanied by a 65-piece live orchestra. The movie itself, a three-hour epic, did not begin until 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> History will not repeat itself today. <laughs> we promise to have you out on time. Now, as time went by, the Chinese theater had its history that has evolved across the years. It's been host to three Academy Award ceremonies, including in 1944, when the 
Oscar for Best Picture went to Casablanca. And this theater has become so emblematic of Hollywood that this great movie palace really became a star unto itself, playing itself in films like Singing in the Rain and Blazing Saddles. Now at AFI, we believe that movie theaters are some of the last places of magic in our world. And we are here in perhaps the most sacred of them all to celebrate you, the storytellers of tomorrow. And look who's gathered here for you today. Your parents and your grandparents who want nothing less than to see you soar. Your brothers and sisters who probably wouldn't choose the word soar. <laughs> they would like glide, like lower to the earth. Your wives and husbands and partners silently believe you are nuts. <laughs> or as we like to call you at AFI, artists. <laughs> Your faculty is here, the men and women who have devoted their lives to sharing what they know and sharing what they've lived. And they leave you today no longer the learner, but the learned. The honorary degree recipients who look out at you and they must see both the passage of time and also the contentment that comes with adversity and achievement. There are trustees of the American Film Institute who see their passion for the legacy of this art form embodied in you and your classmates. And then perhaps most importantly, there's your classmates. Because two years ago, when we welcomed you to AFI, we remember saying, look to your left, look to your right, there's your future. And two years later, how many cycle films, thesis films, and MOS exercises have we done where we can't today just say, look to your left, look to your right, there's your future. Our surveys show that 81% of the alumni of AFI are working. And that's for a very simple reason. When you walk out of these halls today, don't let go. Don't let go. Because you're from AFI. And when your degree says AFI, it says John Ford, Alfred Hitchcock, Betty Davis, Sidney Poitier, masters of the art form and honorees of AFI. It says our founders, including Gregory Peck, Sidney Poitier again, Francis Ford Coppola. It says the White House Rose Garden, where the seeds for AFI were planted and now blossom and grow in your stories. It says Rita Moreno and the American Dream. Quentin Tarantino, an American original. And it says all of the alums who have come before you, Terrence Malick, David Lynch, Darren Aronofsky, Patty Jenkins, Caleb Deschanel, Wally Pfister, Robert Richardson. It says Tom Rickman. Graduate of AFI's very first class in 1969, Oscar nominee for writing The Coal Miner's Daughter, whose journey came full, sissy spaces here, <laughs> whose journey came full circle when in 2007, he joined the conservatory as senior filmmaker in residence for screenwriting. I could go on, but graduates, that is your audience eagerly awaiting your story and the hope that it will bring. So now let's get you out there to tell it by beginning these AFI commencement ceremony services. <coughs> Fade in on the presentation of the honorary degrees. It's the moment we honor an ideal and a journey well traveled so that as you go off on your next adventure, you have a standard that you may aspire to. Our first recipient is one of the great women of the movies and the stage and television. Here to introduce her, a multi-hyphenate herself. I am proud to be among the 7.4 million Twitter followers when she describes, where she describes herself as actress, producer, director, activist, philanthropist, wife, daughter, sister, aunt, friend, and in all caps, human, exclamation point. 
what an honor it is to have her with us today as a trustee of the American Film Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, Ava Longoria. Now that I know you're following me, I'm going to have to curate better. <laughs> it's an honor for me to be here today, um, not only in front of all y'all, but to speak on behalf of this magnificent lady who has meant so much to many, but mostly to me. She is one of the community's most celebrated artists, and I'm talking EGOT people. <laughs> Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony Award winner. She's just one of a handful of artists to have all four. Her work alone is more than reason to be celebrating her today. But she's so much more than her accolades and awards and credits because Rita Moreno is the American dream. A shining, sparkling, singing, dancing example of the American dream. It was Billy Wilder who described movie audiences as those wonderful people in the dark. And there's something magical about how we are one big audience uh, in the glow of the silver screen. But even though that's true, imagine sitting in an audience, having to search to find someone who looks like you on screen. When I was a little girl growing up in Texas and going to the movies, it wasn't easy to find somebody like me somebody who represented me, my story, my experiences. And then I saw West Side Story. Anita, Latina and proud, lighting up the screen. I was inspired, I was hooked, and I'm here today to say that as you go on to write and direct and produce and edit and photograph and design sets, use Rita Moreno as a guiding light to include as many points of view as possible. As a Latino, as a woman, as many other minorities in this world, we're often defined by what you see in the news. But you guys are the narrative form. You get to tell the real stories. So use that as you go forward. Rise above caricature, as she does. Create complete and com complicated characters, as she does and do it with fire and fury and beauty and love as she does. How honored we are all here to be together as one in the glow of the great Rita Moreno. So now it's my honor to bestow AFI's Doctorate of Fine Arts upon Rita Moreno with a reading of the official citation for 2016. You were born at the edge of a rainforest in rural Puerto Rico at the age of three, moving to the urban jungle of New York City, a perfect place for a precocious child to begin her lifelong career as an entertainer. You were a natural from the start, debuting on Broadway at 13 years old and in major Hollywood motion pictures by 19 portending a luminous life in the limelight. You have won our hearts with electrifying performances across screens large and small, on the boards and via voce, earning highest honors for all from each of the four major entertainment awards. You've shared gifts vast and varied from The King and I and Singing in the Rain to The Muppet Show to Oz, from carnal knowledge to Jane the Virgin. But it was your unforgettable turn as Anita in West Side Story that forever secured your place in the Pantheon. You are an aspiring icon whose pioneering performances have made you un ejemplo excepcional for what success looks like on stage and screen. You are the embodiment of the American dream. Things look. 
great. Gonna have the whole world on the plate. A stunning here, a stunning now. Honey, everything's coming up rusting. I like to be in America. Okay by me in America. Everything free in America. For a small fee in America. Okay. Credit is so nice. One look at us and they charge twice. I have my own washing machine. What will you have though to keep clean? <laughs> Skyscrapers bloom in America. Cadillac zoom in America. Industry boom in America. Well, in a room in America. <laughs> Lots of new housing with more space. Lots of doors slamming in our face. I'll get a terrorist apartment. Better get rid of your accent. Life can be bright in America. If you can fight in America. Life is all right in America. If you're all white in America. <laughs>
Can I say something? Can I say some things? Can I say lots of stuff? I was just loving myself in that. <laughs> joyous, amazing piece that is. I, I just, and George, oh my God, and by the way, he still looks that way, I'm gonna kill him. <laughs> oh, what a, thank you. I couldn't believe you were gonna do the whole thing. I kept waiting for the thing to go black. I said, oh. and I said to Elvis, they're gonna show it all. Oh my God, how wonderful. I am so happy to be here. I am so honored to be here, a doctorate. <laughs> A doctorate from a girl who never graduated from school. So there you go. All I can figure is that uh, <clears throat> powers that be are uh, granting me credit for 70 years of not giving up. You see, that's the trick. The trick is just to live for 84 years and wear them the hell down. <laughs> My earliest in front of a camera uh, memory is from my first film in 1950. I was playing Dolores Guerrero, a wayward girl sentenced to reform school in a film called Gergeloins. So young, so bad. <laughs> An agent I had at the time could never get it right. It was so good, so terrible, so sad, so bad. It was very embarrassing. But making that movie, believe me, was not funny at all at that time. <clears throat> in uh, <clears throat> take after take, my character Dolores is nearly drowned under the force of a firehouse. My character, oh hell, that was me being pounded, and rolled across the floor under the pressure of a giant fire hose in an empty garage in the dead of winter in New York City at that time. Obviously, Screen Actors Guild did not have much influence. <laughs> In the end, of course, can you, uh, are you surprised that Dolores commits suicide? Looking back, I now see that that movie was a harbinger for my next decade of work. The Fabulous Senorita, Cattletown, Fort Vengeance, The Ring, Latin Lovers, The Deer Slayer, The Yellow Tomahawk. Get the idea? Oh no, don't applaud those. <laughs> These. And can we possibly? I can't leave out Ma and Pa Kettle go on vacation. I mean, who could forget that? Would you? So. <laughs> Am I getting reviewed here? <laughs> so, you see, my fabulous career started off slow and pretty much tapered off after years of that. I was cast to play every ethnic part the studios needed. Remember the time. Uh, I played every kind of ethnic person you can think of. And with them came what I uh, eventually began to call the universal ethnic accent. Because I didn't know how an Indian princess spoke, so she would talk like this. <laughs> the Arabian girl would talk like this. The Native American girl would talk like this. Today, I refer to those parts in my loving memory as the dusky maiden roles. I had to deliver lines to my white lover like, why do you know no hula no more? <laughs> and when my character, Una, the Indian maiden, is distraught when he, the white man, Summarily rejects her that she flings herself off a cliff. And you know, my long-term memory kicked in as I was recalling this story to tell you. It is a sign, a perfect sign of those times. I remembered that at the end of that scene, 
The director cut to the waves lapping over Ula's lifeless body on the beach at the bottom of the cliff, which of course was me. And in that water were thousands of tiny jellyfish stinging me. <laughs> I, needless to say, am wiggling with discomfort. The director barks, stop twitching for God's sake, you're supposed to be dead. <laughs> but, but Mr. Smith, I don't remember his name. <laughs> I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm just getting stung by a lot of jellyfish. And he replies, God damn it, do as I say. And there you have it. <laughs> he wasn't seeing me as Rita Moreno, a young actress trying to make something of her life. He sees me as Ula. And that, to me, is a perfect example of the kind of life many of us, not just myself, led in those days. Well, those directors and the studios could not succeed in drowning this Puerto Rican because I just kept coming up for air. I mean, that's what I had to do to sustain a career. And as for the outcome, well, I can at least tell you the secret to my success at 84. Never give up. And remember that in order to have it all, you gotta love it all. And one more thing. Never let anybody interfere with your view of yourself and your focus. And never, never stop dreaming. Dream when you're feeling blue. Dream, that's the thing to do. in the air, you'll find your share of memories there, so dream till the day is through, dream, that's the thing. Introduced me to Umami Burger. <laughs> Just one of the things I'm grateful to him for. <laughs> he is a voice of true and pure passion for cinema. He is one of our nation's leading film scholars. For many years, the engaging intellectual voice of the New York Times. You can hear him now on KCRW's The Treatment, and your applause should also acknowledge the amazing work he does as curator of Film Independent at LACMA, where film lives in Los Angeles. The truly lucky in our nation have him as a teacher, from UNLV to Harvard, just as we are lucky to have him with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, Elvis Mitchell. Type in the letters QUE into Wikipedia, the world's leading headquarters for misinformation. 
the entries that come up are Q, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, Quebec, and Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> that means he shows up before the group Queen, Queen Victoria, and Queens, New York. <laughs> right? So things continue from the way they have so far. You'll be the first thing that comes up when you type in the letters Q U. And let's ask ourselves why. Why are we all here? Because we're passionate people. We have these hot blooded, volatile, and sometimes whirling conversations about things that mean something to us. And one of the first things we remember probably with the film Reservoir Dogs is the conversation at the diner, which goes from Madonna's virginity, which I think Donald Trump is still talking about, <laughs> to get Christy love, which he should still be talking about. And it finally lands on this thoughtful and long worked out soliloquy by Mr. Pink about why he won't tip. Why tipping is bad. Is as wrong headed as is a strongly held belief. And somewhere, somewhere, somehow, Donald Trump is pouring into people saying it's how white staff should be treated. And here's why. Because Mr. Pink isn't judged by the movie. There's nothing ominous in the soundtrack. There's no cut to customers glaring at him. His colleagues laugh at him, but they don't change his mind. And the determination of his belief tells us everything, including implying the fact that he's probably a very dangerous man. And there isn't a film by Quentin Tarantino that doesn't include such a speech. It's a speech at the dinner table by Calvin Candy, all spoiled white boy charm and stained teeth in Django Unchained. It's vile, but again, it's a deeply held belief. And the power of his horrible reason holds sway. And as we can always see in Quentin's movies, he smiles as he says it. It's a way to introduce the Hans Landa, the SS Colonel of Inglorious Bastards. He has used his power of deluded reason in his speech about knowing the family hides beneath the floorboards. It's the argument between Jules and Vincent in the last section of Pulp Fiction about eating pork. Vincent nearly swoons as he sings his love song to bacon. And Jules calmly counters it. No one's mind has changed. And after everything has happened, and the two of them the bad motherfucker and his friend walk out of the diner. We imagine in one way or another that conversation will continue. We find it in Jackie Brown when Odell has to convince Beaumont to leave the house, which, spoiler alert, doesn't end well for Beaumont. <laughs> Beaumont is determined to stay home, and Odell gets him out of the house. Beaumont only does it because Odell guilts him into doing it, and he does go out, but he's still convinced he's right. And the subtext and the force of Hordell's argument is even though he's all chuckles and charm, is that he's a very dangerous individual. The pleasure that these characters have in making these arguments and in Hateful Eight and Death Proof and Kill Bill's Volume 1 and 2 all have them is what we delight in and what also very subtly and slowly gives us goose flesh. And that's what directing is. It's not the flashy shots, the compulsively show off stuff we think of and see in commercials. These are the things that take us out of the film. It's the moments that pull us deeper into the film, even as we're fighting these people. That's what filmmaking is. It's handling actors. That's what directing is. That's what makes us recall these characters and believe that they're still talking even after the movie is over. And most importantly, these conversations almost always take place over food. Hans Land is lingering over milk. She was picking at a muffin and eating it. Ordell says is Beaumont with Roscoe's. And even in Kill Bill Volume 2, Beaumont is, I'm sorry, Bill is making a sandwich as he breaks us down with the psychology of Superman. The films leave us, well, hungry, with an appetite for more and for a meal. So, with that, I guess we should talk about filmmaker and friend to the restaurant industry, Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> but now, it is my honor to bestow the AFI's Doctorate of Fine Arts upon Quentin Tarantino with a reading of the official citation for 2016. You were born in Knoxville, Tennessee, and raised in Southern California, but you traveled the world via passports provided by local movie houses and video stores. 
With cinema's masters leading your way, you explored the art form, unearthed its secrets, and tapped its potential to create a language all your own. You have subverted our best loved cinematic conventions, reimagining them and reinventing storytelling itself. As early as Reservoir Dogs, you drafted the blueprint for contemporary cool, with each subsequent entry into your iconic classic canon furthering your mastery of the art form. From Pulp Fiction to Jackie Brown, Kill Bill to Inglorious Bastards, Django Unchained to The Hateful Eight. You are the boldest and baddest voice in American film. One whose unique fusion of cinema past and present maps a path towards its exciting future. And one whose passion for the art form is also as palpable and explosive as nitrate. <laughs> that bag and find my wallet. Which one is it? It's the one that says bad motherfucker. That's it. That's my bad motherfucker. Open it up. Take out the money. How much is there? About fifteen hundred dollars. Okay, put it in your pocket. It's yours. Now with the rest of those wallets in the register, that makes this a pretty successful little score, huh? Jules, you give that fucking Nimrod fifteen hundred dollars and I'll shoot him on general principle. No, Yolanda, Yolanda, he ain't gonna do a goddamn motherfucking thing. Vince, shut the fuck up! Shut up! Come on, Yolanda, stay with me, baby. Now, I ain't giving it to him, Vincent. I'm buying something for my money. Wanna know what I'm buying, Ringo? What? Your life. I'm giving you that money so I don't have to kill your ass. You read the Bible, Ringo? Not regularly, no. Well, there's this passage I got memorized. Ezekiel 25, 17. The path of the righteous man is beset on all sides by the inequities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil men. Blessed is he who in the name of charity and goodwill shepherds the weak through the valley of darkness, for he is truly his brother's keeper and the finder of lost children. And I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger those who attempt to poison and destroy my brothers. And you will know I am the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon you. I've been saying that shit for years. And if you heard it, that meant your ass. I never gave much thought to what it meant. I just thought it was some cold-blooded shit to say to a motherfucker before I popped a cap in his ass. I saw some shit this morning made me think twice. See, now I'm thinking, maybe it means you're the evil man and I'm the righteous man. And Mr. Nine Millimeter here He's the shepherd protecting my righteous ass in the valley of darkness. Or it could mean you're the righteous man and I'm the shepherd. And it's the world that's evil and selfish. Now, I'd like that. But that shit ain't the truth. The truth is you're the weak and I'm the tyranny of evil men. But I'm trying, Ringo. I'm trying real hard to be the shepherd.
I think we should be leaving now. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Everybody, and, and especially uh, graduate artists today. Um, I guess uh, this is the year that you give, are giving doctorates to people who never finished uh, school. <laughs> it's the same thing. Uh, uh, you know, I got to say one thing about the one. Uh, I agree with uh, Rita completely about one of the things that was so nice about these uh, the things that you're showing is you're showing uh, uh, the whole scenes. So it's not just a bunch of bunch of our stuff. It's like boom, one scene you get a, a sense of. And one thing to uh, mention to you filmmakers out there, just watching that scene right now, I've, I've thought about this before, but for some reason being in this environment made me think about it. Watching that scene, the scene's pretty good, but one of the things that I think actually almost makes it right, right just the perfect moment is after. Uh, Jewel says his, makes his point. The camera rack focuses to uh, um, uh, the gun be uncocked. The gun's been cocked, and then the rack focus happens to uh, uh, the cock, whatever, I can't remember what you call it, all right? Uh, 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 and his thumb, and he puts it back into place, and that, diffuses everything, and that actually makes the point. Even as much as that big speech was, you need that moment to officially shut down the moment, to shut, shut, uh, make the point. Now, I've been directing now over 20 years. I would know now to tell the focus puller to go to that part of the gun at that moment, especially catch his thumb as he does it. I didn't know enough to say that on my second movie, to get that specific about where the focus needs to be thrown at such a given moment. I was just lucky enough to have a really fantastic focus puller who actually knew that that was where he needed to be. And something about that, watching it just now, really, really rang, rang a bell. And, and um, I guess that the point of that is when you're doing your work, you really need to think about all, all the different aspects, and you need to think about all the different people who are working with you, who are really there to give you the best that they have and what you need, and you really need to avail yourself of them. And you really need to get that specific, where it's not all about that big, giant speech in the week that if we shot it. it kind of comes down at a certain moment of something very small and minute that you might not be thinking about. And something wonderful about getting this here and getting it from AFI, um, I quit, I, I actually never even went to high school. I, I quit in junior high, I quit in the ninth grade. Um, I actually did try to enroll in AFI <laughs> in, in the early 80s. Uh, Trust me, it's not a situation where I was this Basquiat-like character and I offered up my, my wonderfulness and they threw it in the trash. No, no, it wasn't that. Uh, 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 I, you had to offer up a film 
and I had never made a film, and so I literally made one on a Sunday, <laughs> on Super 8, and offered it to them like on Tuesday. Um, and not only that though, it was also something wonderful about getting it here, because I actually tried to get a job at the Gramas Chinese Theater too, and that didn't happen either. <laughs> Reservoir Dogs, I was invited to go to uh, AFI and screen the movie and have a, a question and answer session with the fellows. And I, I felt that was this. I felt that was my honorary degree, all right? The idea that you actually were going to be asked to see my movie and actually have me do a question and answer session with the students. Um, what I, I guess what I, one of the things I really have to say to all of you who are graduating this is your time. I, I've been doing this now a little over 20 years, and i um, do it for a little bit longer. Um, but uh, the next 20 years is, is for you guys. Uh, the next 30 years is for you all. And I'm challenging you and imploring you to do your best. And I think your best is to be part of the conversation. Be part of the conversation. Be part of the artistic conversation. Contribute to the conversation of art. Contribute to the conversation on film, on television, on multimedia. Con contribute to the conversation on race. Contribute to the conversation on culture. Contribute to the conversation on America. Contribute to the conversation on the world. Contribute to the conversation on politics. Every one of your movies should be, or your commercials or TV shows or whatever it plays, whatever you're doing, it should be the next part of your conversation. And everything you add to it, every daisy chain that happens as you make your art is just another chance for you to be part of the conversation. And nothing will make me happier than eight years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now. Maybe we'll be at some event together. And you guys will be making movies or television. And you'll come up to me and say, hey, I was one of those guys. I was one of those girls. I was in the cat. And I listened to you. <laughs> I listened to you that day at the Chinese theater. And um, one of the things I have to say is just, welcome. We need you. presentation of the degrees, and first, to introduce a voice from the class of 2016, the Dean of the AFI Conservatory. I wish to warn Mr. Tarantino, this is not a Christoph false impersonator. <laughs> he is the real deal, an educator, an ambassador, who has driven forward graduates by you by your questions, by your search for the answers. He feels your pain and he celebrates your triumphs because he too is a filmmaker first. Ladies and gentlemen, the Dean of the AFI Conservatory, Jan Schutta. Dear Dr. Marino, Dear Dr. Tarantino, dear honorees, dear faculty, dear staff, dear family and friends, 
dear class of 2016. Your opening day, two years ago, was two years ago and it also was my opening day. Time flies. We must now say farewell to you, but we won't say goodbye. I want to take a moment to thank all of you, faculty and staff, for the great commitment as you to, to teach you as young storytellers and working with you as young peers and colleagues. The parents and grandparents, thank you for sending these wonderful fellows here to us and thank you, thank you for supporting them so well. And to the fellows, it's been a great class. Thank you for being so enthusiastic, challenging and creative. With all these talents, we are excited for you. We are looking forward to all the great work, the great movies, the great television shows, all the great stories you want to tell. It has been an honor for all of us to serve you. We will miss your presence on campus a great deal, but we look forward to seeing you in your new role as alumni of the conservatory. Can't say it better than Quentin just said it. I want to see you and welcome you and premieres and openings and everywhere in the next 20 or 30 years. So it's time for me now to introduce the class of 2016 class speaker, the producing fellow Trevor Smith. Trevor has been in a remarkable presence on campus since day one. I have to share one, one moment with you first. Um, I was teaching, I was pretty new at the AFI and I was teaching the narrative workshop. And I have 116 fellows and I try to learn their names. It's pretty difficult. So many names. And then they do something very, very kind of unfair to me. They have a break and everybody sits in a different place. And everybody has a hat on or a different t-shirt, or so it's horrible. <laughs> I feel lost. But I had two rocks. One was Ken sitting on the second row outside. <laughs> One was Trevor sitting on the sixth row over there on the right side. So at least I had two posts where I could or had my orientation. Thank you for doing this, it was very kind. <laughs> Trevor, in the next couple of weeks, you will return to your native Toronto. You're going to get married. Then you start working as a producer. Um, but I know, and I hope, you're going to come back to Los Angeles one day, and this is not always a question. And we will all be looking forward to this day. Because you produce comedies. Comedies is a very, very difficult genre. It's like the most difficult, maybe. You formed a great relationship with Drew. You made a fantastic team and worked on three films together. That's what we think. You meet your, you don't, we don't teach you, you meet your future at AFI. And you want to continue to make comedies. That's a real challenge. Trevor, we need more fellows than you, as you. Like you, sorry. But I want to share with all of you a moment I had with Trevor last year. The magazine Variety has asked us to nominate five students to watch. How on earth could we choose five out of 260 on campus? All highly talented. It was a problem, but not nominating anybody would also be a wrong signal to the world outside. So Mr. Valley had the wonderful idea that we post an ad in the magazine saying, in a way, congratulating all the nominated students, but also saying, you know, we can't choose any of these 260 highly talented uh, students, fellows who are walking the halls, walking the halls of the conservatory. So when I opened my 
email the next day, the first email in my inbox was from Trevor. And I read it to you. Evening Jan. Why the thoughts of one lowly first year producing fellow may not mean much. I just wanted to let you know how much I personally appreciated this decision to say bravo for the showmanship shown here as well. Now in parentheses, for some reason since reading your email, I cannot help but think back to Don Draper's Why I'm Quitting Tobacco at the New York Times from season four of Mad Men. If nothing else, I hope it's a compliment that now link your letter and my second favorite television show of all time. <laughs> Thank you for your stewardship as a leader of our great school and for supporting us all. I have to admit I was deeply moved by this email. It has style, it has class, and it has heart. So I want to say to all of you, here's one fellow to watch. And here are not 16 fellows to watch. So Trevor, for you is yours. So now I have to be funny, I guess, if I'm going to make comedies. Um, <laughs> greeting source team guests are our AFI family and our actual families. Most importantly, congratulations to my fellow fellows, graduating class of 2016. It's a standard requirement of commencement speeches, it seems, to deploy some sort of didactic story or lesson. To offer remembrances that seek to explain the value of our education that we've received here for the last two years. Before I do that, I'll just do the most Canadian thing possible and say, sorry. <laughs> um, but when I I mean the value of this education, I mean the real human value of what we've accomplished, not some material payoff. This is AFI after all. There's no material payoff. <laughs> Guys, get ready for lots of artistic merit and student debt. Uh, now the bad news is everyone in the first three rows know that I don't really have anything thoughtful to share. Um, but rather than admit that, and just say, be cool, and offer my remarks, as the shortest in AFI history, I thought I'd submit the notion that the real no bullshit value of this experience can go into three categories. The first is a chance to find your team, the second is a chance to find your story, and the third is the importance of hard work. That's it, just three ideas about what AFI has been worth and how it will be used in our road ahead. So first, to make a great film, you need teammates. You need to collaborate. Alone, we can do little, but together, we can do so much more. When we first arrived on campus on August 18th, uh, 2014, in so many ways we were alone. A group of individuals, talented individuals, but individuals. And we knew that we wanted to make films, but with whom? Who could we work with? Who understood our motivations and our influences? Slowly, through narrative workshop triumphs and humiliations, through weekend meetings with Betsy, where we argued what was a stunt and if Chipotle really counted as a fair lunch. <laughs> Through long nights at Public House or Edendale or Jesper's house <laughs> or wherever the rap party was that week, we found our people, our co-conspirators. That part doesn't stop after AFI. At our very first Harold Lloyd Master Seminar, at Zwick and Steven Rosenblum talked about their decade-long relationship working together. Every Friday we had filmmakers forums to come our entire teams of recent AFI graduates spoke to us. And we saw the lasting impact of AFI helping find our tribe. So whether you're on set, in a writer's room, in a production design trailer in the edit bay, or just in the gridlock of daily adult life, remember that collaboration makes us better. Having great teammates isn't about giving up your individuality, it's about realizing your full potential. So treat every connection that you've made here over these two years as a continuous relationship. Second, I mentioned the importance of finding your voice. Margaret Atwood, my fellow Canadian, said that you're never going to kill something uh, like storytelling because it's built into our human plan. We come with it. I would offer that storytelling is what connects us to our humanity. It links us to our past, gives us a glimpse of our future. Since humans first walked the earth, we've told stories so that we know how other humans feel, so that we may live with another's pain, their joy, their heartache, and their love. It reaffirms our humanity. Storytelling is how we 
derive meaning from the chaos of our own existence. And film is how we are choosing to do it. Film and story provide us with the shape so that our own lives have a beginning, middle, and end. Your AFI, AFI life had a beginning on a real night with Schwartzy, when we all sat there for eight hours wondering how we all got in here. <laughs> Your middle was team for thesis last spring, and the ending is whenever, whenever I shut the hell up and sit back down. <laughs> so during workshops two years ago, our dearly departed friend and mentor, Gil Dennis, pushed us to tell our own stories, to mine our fear, shame, and joy, to find our truth. As you continue your careers, honor Gil and our other teachers, Remember that story is why you're here. This industry is more likely to eat you alive than it is to cut you a break. So if you're here because you're pursuing power, you will eventually feel weak and afraid. If you're pursuing this work because you want to be surrounded by fame and beauty, you'll always eventually feel ugly. And if you're pursuing it for financial stability, you need to have your head examined. <laughs> but if you can remember to show attention and awareness discipline to what made you choose this crazy path in the first place, your love of story and its power to help, you'll be fine. So find your terror, your shame, and your joy, and have the honesty and moral courage to make sure that you're making the movies that you want to make. If you're making comedies, make them funny. If you're making drama, make us feel something. Finally, I'll talk about the importance of hard work. Cliché, I know, but remember that I basically work at AFI, so... Um, <laughs> Making movies, even bad movies, is really, really hard. When we work here together, we try to make them as good as they could be. And when you put a creative effort in and it doesn't work out, you kind of, kind of wonder what's the point. Trust me that when you're sitting on stage during a narrative workshop and the only compliment you get is from David Brent about how nice your suit looks, <laughs> you question a lot of your decisions. Waking up for 5 a.m. crew calls in Santa Clarita isn't fun. Preparing for five week out meetings isn't fun. So yeah, life at AFI was hard. But it'll be even harder out there. And it will only make you'll only make it if you bust your ass. Entertainment is not a meritocracy. No one will hand you success because you're talented. Teddy Roosevelt once said that far and away the best prize in life is to work hard at work worth doing. I've already outlined that I believe storytelling and filmmaking is in fact work worth doing. And I would just add that doing it with people that you love makes it truly special. So those are our three thoughts, team, story, work. So I'm positing to you, the beautiful people that thankfully I can't see because of the lights in front of me, <laughs> that the real value of these two years of AFI has been working hard towards a great purpose and with people that you cherish. So soon, 15, 20 minutes from now, a new challenge awaits all of us. Just trust that your team, this AFI family, these three rows on back has your back. Trust that your story is worth telling and fall in love with the process of working hard to bring it to life every day. Thank you my friends and my fellows for all that you've shown me. There are many great things that you and I have yet to do. So go find your team, find your story, get to work, and I wish you way more than luck. First class, this is a gentleman introducing the very early David Lynch. Um, and I want to ask one of the faculty members of screenwriting, Betty Meyer, to come down. She wants to give a small speech from the screenwriting faculty. Thank you. small hours before dawn, while all of you were fast asleep or maybe tossing and turning, a man was writing, perhaps his latest play, his 33rd screenplay, or maybe his second novel, but hard at work he was. And when he reached that page count goal, he got up and made biscuits. Then the sun came up, and soon he was on his way to the AFI, just a typical morning for Tom Rickman. 
Tom began his screenwriting and directing career right here at the AFI as a member of the, its very first class ensconced in the legend, legendary Greystone Mansion in the days when David Lynch secretly lived in the stables. And Kayla Deschanel shot the short that Gil Dennis wrote and Tom starred in. As Tom jokes, I have no idea why AFI selected me. Maybe they needed to fill the hillbilly quota. <laughs> he went on to write such beloved works as Coal Miner's Daughter, Everybody's All American, Tuesdays with Maury, Truman, The Reagans, and even directed a couple of features. All of us on the screenwriting faculty want to say, that we are so thrilled, Tom, you came home to AFI a decade ago to become the head of our discipline. And we want to express our deep love and respect for him as he continues at AFI in a new role as filmmaker in residence. Tom has led both faculty and fellows by example with his devotion to self-expression, dogged discipline, dedication to hard work, and an unbridled passion for humanity and its stories. He is what we all aspire to be, an inspiring teacher, a master storyteller, and a compassionate human being. One of Tom's fellows said, in a town not known for its humility, Tom serves as an incomparable reminder that at the end of the day, kindness and empathy is at the heart of what we do. Without compassion, our work loses all meaning, and having Tom as a teacher, taught me how to not only express humanity on the page, but also to be a more loving person. And here's another quote from another fellow. I'll never forget the look on Tom's face whenever he reached into his bottomless soul and brilliant brain to offer a gem of an idea for my screenplay in progress. That look is a joy of discovery, a joy of storytelling, it is the joy of sharing the work, and Tom makes it all contagious. We all feel it is a privilege to be working with Tom, but it's also a kick to hang out with him. So in the future, when you have a meeting with him or just want to have lunch with him, get there early and hope everyone else is late because you must dive into a conversation with him about anything from Jesus to gene the theory, his breadth of knowledge, sharp wit, and intrepid intellect will always reward you. Tom, all of us in screenwriting are thrilled to have you step into your broader role next year, and the other disciplines are delighted to finally call you theirs as well. So let's get this party started now and pass up those diplomas. <laughs> Screenwriting, Joshua Eichenbaum. <laughs> Chai Ajit. <laughs> Brian Aaron. <laughs> Dory Anis. <laughs> Julia Arribas Mantelli. David Milton Brent. Matthew Carrigan. Connor Lloyd Cruz. Kathleen Elizabeth Cummings. Edward G. Excalibur. Christopher Michael Greenslick. Paul Immermann. Victor Nascimento. Oh, 
Elliot O. Patkowski. Mainz, Polen. Ivano Polito. Muniz Rashid. Rose Chim. Aline Chim. Stacy Spruill. Daisy Green Webster Stenhouse. Mauricio <laughs> Swartman. <laughs> Bernardo Biotti. <laughs> so now we move on to the discipline of cinematography. <laughs> Jinpi Shiku Ugawara. Stanislav Bondarenko. Peace Castrado. David Chavi. William Laney Christensen. Joshua Fisher, Britton Lee Foster, Marcy Garcia, Andrea Gonzalez Merlis. Jesper Duelund Hansen. <laughs> Kenneth Heller. <laughs> Again, for CPM. <laughs> Joni Klein. <laughs> D. Leo. Jake Carl Baji. Ayan <laughs> <Dayan> Manchego. <laughs> Jessica Pantoja. <laughs> Raza Patin. Scott <laughs> Ray. Alida Robinson. Andres Solatano. Caleb Toy. Ushvara Viswana. Kay Young. Joshua Zakatluda. In the discipline of directing, Peter Marker. Daniel Abatan. Sophia Astro. Kevin Bluestein. Not 
Markus Katsulis. Michael Gukjelsen Konzau. Song Wong. Patrick Jenkins. Rosita Lama Mufti. Yue Ma. Lucy McHenry. Casey Moderno. <laughs> Mia Nibucci. <laughs> Boyo Neo. <laughs> Joseph Oppenheimer. Santiago Paladines. <laughs> Melissa Perez. <laughs> Drew Pollens. <laughs> Max Sokolov. <laughs> Julius Christian Thelmer. Kai Towns. <laughs> Malcolm Heiss Washington. <laughs> Jackson Young. <laughs> you can of anything, Vincent. Dinara Timova. Reynolds Barney. <laughs> Bo Kader. <laughs> Bernice Chavez. <laughs> Brian John Denny. Bang the Han. Rosie Lejour. Rebecca Lodi. Dana Maddox. Raphael Nur. <laughs> David Michael Scocker. <laughs> Ranchio Soon. <laughs> Veronica Vatskova. Christopher Young. Christine <laughs> of producing Neil Tempton. <laughs> Faraz Al Fukaha. <laughs> Thomas Berg. Jeremy Chan. <laughs> Michael Dudley. <laughs> Emmanuel 
Francoeur. <laughs> Jessica Cole. <laughs> Freya Garcia. <laughs> Jane Virginia Holland. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kudai Kim <laughs> Kulabako Chambinji <laughs> Kate Lavin Thank you. 